Let's be excited about what God wants to do in the generations. Tonight we will have again a three inning service. Three of us will be uh, sharing a word, uh, short words, and I'm the opening batsman. We'll be the class of 2003 sharing tonight. Let's give us a round of applause. The class of 2003. We were first years together, myself, Conrad, and Emil. And uh, so that's a couple of years ago. But I'm not as old as they are, just to get that off the. Good. My question to you tonight, I'll be speaking to the younger generation. If you feel it's you, take it. If you don't feel it's you, still take some snippets. God wants to speak to you about certain things. My question to you, what are you doing with your mandate? Is your mandate on the shelf? Is it a nice idea? Is it a nice thought? No, I've got a mandate. Great, God's got a mandate with me. What are you doing with your mandate? There's a reason why you have a mandate. God has placed inside of each one of us. Each one of us, the you, you've got your own mandate that nobody else can live out except you. I cannot copy and paste Sichaba's mandate because it's not for me. He needs to live out that mandate. I cannot live out that mandate for him. He needs to understand the importance of taking hold and responsibility of understanding. This is my mandate. I have to live it out. You've got a specific role to play with that mandate. A mandate and a role that fits together uniquely in the kingdom of God on earth. And you need to take hold of that. Every day God's got a unique plan for you specifically for your mandate. doesn't matter how old you are. The youth today, they get caught up with other things, other things in life. Other things that they want to do or must do or have to do. But there's an important thing that we have to understand. You have a unique role to play on earth for the kingdom of God with your mandate. And there's something planned for you for every day. Let's turn to Ephesians 2 verse 10. Or for those who have your Bible, you can turn. For the rest, you can scroll there. Ephesians 2 verse 10, I'm reading from the Amplified. For we are God's own handiwork, His workmanship created in Christ Jesus, born anew, that we may do those good works which God predestined, planned beforehand for us, taking paths which He prepared ahead of time, that we should walk in them, living the good life which He prearranged. So here, within our mandate, God already designed something for you to do every day. In your mandate, Sichaba, there is a code, a lock in your mandate already. This is what you have to do today. What are you doing with your mandate today? Are you living your mandate? Because in Ephesians 2, we read and we know that God has got a plan for you, Nazi, for every day. The man has a date with you today. There's a mandate on your life for today. What are you doing with yours? Takes a while, I know takes a while. The man has a date with you today. Are you meeting him or did you miss it? What are you doing with your mandate? There's two systems I'm going to talk about. We are on earth but not from earth. We've got the citizenship of heaven. We are in this earth for just a time being put here but we've got a citizenship from heaven. That mandate comes from heaven straight to our spirit. But we're living in this world, this earth, this world has got a system, and heaven's got a system. Heaven's system is based on truth. Worldly system is based on opinions. If we live in this world that's based on opinions, and we've got a mandate from heaven, we've got to live the truth in this world. What are you doing with your mandate today? Are you living the truth or are you settling with the opinions of this world? We are called to be ambassadors of the kingdom on earth. Ambassadors. Look to the person next to you and say, ambassador. If you're representing the kingdom of God, you've got a calling. There's a mandate on your life to live on this earth. That system works according to opinions. You have to live according to the mandate from heaven. That means you're living truth and walking out Christ. What are you doing with your mandate today? Because we have to understand this mandate as an integrated role in the kingdom that you have to live. 
on this earth. For the specific time when you were born, God knew I had to have uh, Leander set his foot on this earth because for that specific time, he needs to do this for the kingdom of God just to fall in place. Please make sure that we will not be the generation that lives according to the worldly system, driven by opinions or things, but we will be the kingdom generation that lives according to the truth. We will walk, up, walk out Christ because of the truth that's living in, inside of us. Amen? This world today, this time today, we always want to give a person a piece of our mind. When he upsets you in this world, your opinion, let me give you a piece of my mind. But instead of giving a piece of your mind, give him a piece of your spirit. Because that you're giving him truth. Then you start living according to what God's ordained for you today. Because you're not giving a piece of your mind. The Bible says in Romans 2, verse, uh, 12, verse 2, Be transformed by the renewing of your mind, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, do not be conformed to this world. In the Amplified, do not be conformed to this world. To its external, superficial, but be transformed. Renewal of your mind. We need to change this mindset because the world is going to bombard you with opinions. And if you sit, sit down and you settle with those opinions and feel comfortable with it, you will not be able to live the truth which is God ordained for you within your mandate to live truth in this world where we are currently. How are we going to do this? Very simple. Let's turn or scroll to Psalm 119 verse 9. Psalm 119 verse 9 says, Oh, shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed and keeping watch according to your word, conforming his life to it. If we are in this earth with so much opinions, how are we going to live it according to the word? We need to dig into the word. The word will cleanse your way. He will cleanse who you are. The application of the word brings clarification and purification in your walk. But the application of the world brings confusion, distortion. I don't know who I am. I don't know what I want to do. If we are that generation filled with opinions and only drawn and led by opinions, we will miss the man that originally ordained from God to live in this world. We have to live the truth and walk Christ on this earth. Amen. This is how we will stand. I'm using Jesus as an example. In his weakest moment, in, uh, not his weakest moment, one of the moments, Luke 4, he was, went up to the mountain for 40 days. He spent time with God and was tempted and all those things. 40 days. And at the end of Luke 4, not in the middle, it says, then he became hungry after 40 days. Shane? After 40 days or four days? 40. He says, 40. Yes, I will feel after four days. Hey, it's, it's, I need something. Four hours. Some is four hours. Four minutes, some is 40 seconds. Let's not go into detail. Jesus, hungry after four, 40 days. When you're hungry, we've got a saying in my house, some people get hangry. A bit of a mix of angry and hungry together. You don't know if you should approach them or should wait or would know. Just give them something. Just leave the food. You know, like a dog. Ah, just eat. Let him eat first and then approach. Hangry. That's how you approach hangry people. But, um, yeah, Jesus was hungry, and the, the world came. devil came and tempted him. He was hungry. When you're hungry, irritated, you don't want something to nag or something, somebody, you just want to eat. But the devil comes, the world comes with the opinion and says to Jesus, aren't you the son of God? Come, change a bit of that stone into bread. At your weakest moment, when you're most upset, and your sister, your brother, your husband, your wife, or your friend just Yaps at you. You just want to kick them. That's the time when Jesus says he's going to give you the truth. The enemy, the world comes with every time of a type of temptation, pornography, lust, bad thoughts, movies, media, whatever. At your weakest moment, you'll just sit there. Your guard is down. The enemy comes and he takes you out. Soft target. In the, weakest, in the weakest moment, Jesus replied with the word. Not according to opinions of the world and give him an opinion. Uh -uh. He replied with the truth, the word. We need to fill ourselves with the word. Take word. We need to be filled with that word of God.
There's many examples in that chapter where Jesus was tempted, but he just repeated and just replied with, it is written. The word was in his heart. It was in his mind. It was infused with him. His reply was, it is written. When the world comes to you with its opinion, do you sit? Or can you reply, the word of God says this. Or do you reply with opinion or past experience? This world that we live in needs the truth. They need to know who Christ is through your life. There's a specific mandate on your life that you have to live out currently. What are you, what are you doing with your mandate? Philippians 1 verse 21. I'm going to end off speaking a little bit about Paul. Philippians 1 verse 21 says the following. For me to live is Christ, His life in me, and to die is gain. For me to live is, is Christ, and to die is gain. When Paul wrote this, he went through a couple of things in his life already. Where Paul was beaten. Some guys got together and said, this guy is not thinking straight. He wants to proclaim Jesus, we have to nail him. So they got him, they beat him, good, they made a good, you know, imprint on his body, colored him in in different phases, you know, there's purple, blue, green, however you might feel. But that did not put Paul to rest to say, nah. It gave him the courage to live out his mandate even more. So they say, okay, we can't get into this guy's brain by beating him. Let's attack his body even more. Let's go him with clipper, with a bit of stones. So they stoned him. I mean, if you stone somebody, I don't think it's a very nice view. Or that person has a very nice experience. But he was stoned, and within that being stoned, he just got so excited to live more of Christ. This world is just throwing opinions and stones. Imagine me and David go into... Uh, we heard Paul was stoned yesterday, so we go to a clinic and we arrive there. We want to pray for Paul and say, Paul, are you right, man? Paul is in gips, in gips. What is gips? That thing which keeps you straight. He's, he was just stoned yesterday and he lies there with a smile. Ah, God spoke to me. Something came loose in my spirit. I'm ready. He's lying there. The world is trying to put him down. But if the Spirit of Christ is mandate, he cannot refuse his mandate. He has to live his mandate even more. To live is Christ every day. His life is to live Christ every day. If they killed me, yes, I would have been in heaven. Oh, yeah, man, they just missed it a couple of centimeters. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Can you and I say that? There's a mandate for you and me every day on this life, on this earth. For our lives, we need to walk it out. When the enemy of the world comes and chirps opinions or say this and that, it must give us reason to dig deeper into the truth. We need to fill ourselves with the word so that we can live and walk out the truth on earth. What are you doing with your mandate? The world has to force me and drive me to seek deeper into the word, to live this mandate even louder on this earth. Otherwise, I'm wasting time with my mandate. What are you doing with your mandate? Father God, I want to pray for each one here tonight. Lord, that there will just be a reawakening of the mandate that you've already placed inside of them. That they will go dig deep, Father. Find out what is that. How to live accurately every day according to your perfect will. Lord, I pray that we know that you are already preordained things for us to do in every day. I'll pray that we will be found faithful. And when the enemy of this worldly system comes with their opinion, it will drive us with excitement to the word, to live the truth which is already in us, Father God. I pray that we will align ourselves, that life is Christ, die is gain. Thank you for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Second innings. It's awesome to be with you guys. Now I am going to be speaking about the generation that is just after that, so 20 to 50, no? 20 to 60, somewhere around there. So, um, but like Grant said, um, 
is something that can be learned from every generation. I mean, these principles are, are generation specific, but can be covered in all generations. Hallelujah. So this period of time in our lives is what many people call the prime of your year, the prime of your life. You've heard it, the prime of your life, the best years of your life. Now, the older people, my, my 60 plus cell group will disagree with me. Uh, I disagree with myself already. I don't believe in this. It's the best years of your life. When I turned 18, these are the best years of my life. When I turned 21, these are now the best years of my life. 30, these are, at 40, I'm like, this is the best time of my life. And I'm sure I'm going to say that at 60, whatever, whatever, whatever. It all depends how you see things. But for the, uh, in the uh, scripture, there's a lot of uh, scriptures that talk about the prime of your life. Job 29 is an excellent scripture. I recommend that you go read that. About Job talking about the prime of his life and how God was with him. So there is something about this time period in our life. The reason being is because we at the height of our powers. Meaning we at the height of our physical strength, our physical health. I mean, we can run. I mean, you guys can run a lot faster than me. I'm, I'm towards the, the end of that prime. You know, I'm, what do you call it? It's, it's spur lazy age state. It's, it's been, yeah, but it's been extra prime now. It's <laughs> not forget fraud, but it's prime. <laughs> but you're at the height of your strength, your, your, your physical, your natural energy, your enthusiasm. Uh, yes, your IQ, no, your IQ. You be, but you are the best you can be. Um, you know, it is the years of vision, passion, and energy. Joel 2 speaks about, uh, the, he speaks about the Spirit of God coming down. In those days, your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. It's the time of vision. The world is opening up for me. I can see so many things that I can do, that I can achieve. My whole future lies ahead of me. What can I accomplish? What can I do? My life is full of so much vision. All right? The years of passion. The Bible talks a lot about the young lions, the strength of the young lions and the strength of the young man. I mean, wherever I went on tour, when I, when, when I was touring for, in, in Criari, they would speak about, oh, it's so wonderful to see you young people living full out for Christ, you know? And we're reckless in our faith. We're reckless in, our, in, in so many different areas, in a good way and in, in a bad way. But these are why it's called the best years of our life. However, one of the problems is many of us waste these years chasing the things of the world. We waste our energy. We waste our passion. We waste our vision. We spend all our time on the systems of the world. Now, I'm going to talk a little bit about our careers just now, but it's not wrong to have a career. But the problem is we put ourselves, ourselves completely, we, we, we baptize ourselves in, in, this, in this vision of success, of achievement, of getting a family, my, my house right, my, getting a car, having a certain stature, having a certain degree. It becomes, it consumes my focus. And many people spend their whole lives in the system. I mean, how many people have I met towards the end of their lives? They're like, okay, Lord, what can I do for God now? Or after I've finished everything, Lord, what can I do for you? I'm in retirement now. It's not a bad thing. I know somebody who's made a huge impact since he's retired. But may it not be at your retirement that you say, okay, God, I've got this amount left. What do you want me to do with it? We need to spend the best years of our life focused upon God and His kingdom. I don't know about you, but like in my quiet time, I had to work through it as well, but I didn't like, I'm not a morning person. When I was a student house leader, they knew, don't greet me in the mornings, don't speak to me, nothing, until I've had my second, third cup of coffee, then you can speak to me. And in my quiet times, I wanted to give my best times to God. So the morning was definitely not the best time because I'm still not 100% in the mornings. I can't focus like a... I don't, I'm not able to give myself 
So I would find a time where I'm at my best and give that to God. How, as, as far as possible. I know that when I, when I want to give an offering, if I've got an old crumpled 20 rand note that has been through the washing machine, went through spa and pep and everywhere, and I've got a brand new 20, have you ever had those brand new notes in your wallet? You know, it's like crisp. You, know, you can almost smell it. It smells a bit like clay, but it's so awesome. I would want to give that note in the offering and not the crumpled one. That's just, that's just my mentality. I want to give my very best to God. May that be like that in our lives. That the very best of our time, the very best of our focus, the very best of my passion and energy is invested into God and His kingdom. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not saying you mustn't have a career. I'm not telling you to go into, into full-time ministry and every person must be a missionary until they're 40. No, I'm not saying that at all. I was having a discussion with someone yesterday about this. I said, one of the problems that we find, because I, I, from the prophetic word that from Pastor Arthur, he was talking about businesses being established and things like that. And I said, one of the problems is, when we're involved in full-time ministry, we don't know how to focus on God and have business. And a lot of people in business don't know how to focus on God in their business. When, you, when people go to work, the Lord disappears from their mind. The Lord disappears from their focus or from their actions. When I tell you, we need to establish the kingdom of God in your businesses, a lot of people think, I need to evangelize. I need to tell people about Jesus in my business. That's a very small aspect of the kingdom of God. The gospel of salvation is only the entrance point to the, to the kingdom. The gospel of the kingdom is far wider than just the gospel of salvation. Because the kingdom is an entire, is an entire ecosystem. It's politics. It's education. We've got to learn to think outside of the box when it comes to establishing the kingdom of God in the secular world. It's a religious mindset to say that establishing the kingdom of God is just preaching the gospel. Like in education, laying down concepts, forming a different, a different, a different dynamic of how education should work. In my business, showing such integrity and excellence and quality in my business that it becomes a shining example of what business is. Do you hear what I'm saying? In politics, all of these realms, all of these areas where we need to make an impact, we've got to learn to think outside of the box of how can I make an impact. When you can understand that, you can focus fully on God in your, in your surroundings, in your varsity, in your workplace, wherever it may be. But let's not waste all our be- the prime years of our lives on the systems of this world. I said to my dad, when my dad found out I was coming to Kriari 17 years ago, he wasn't super happy because I had a job, I, was, I had my, my pension, whatever, you know. I, was, I remember I was driving with him in the car and I said, Dad, I'm leaving for Bloemfontein in three weeks. <coughs> Stop the car out there. What? Are you crazy? How are you going to do this? How are you going to pay for your family? How are you going to bring up all... No, 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 no out of genuine care and love for me. And I just said, Dad, I don't want to live my life to pay my debts and die. To pay the bills and die. Then you're living for the systems of this world. If that is your life, Christian or non-Christian, if you are just living to get along, to to provide bread for your family, and to pay your rent, etc., etc., that is not advancing the kingdom of God. Let us spend the best years of our life investing into the things of God and His kingdom. Amen? Then we get to a different aspect, and you young people are not there yet. Some of us are entering into that stage. Some of us are in that stage, and some of us are still in that stage, even though we should be out. Many people, and the world calls it a midlife crisis. Now, a midlife crisis, what that is, is I stand and I look back at my life, and I ask myself the question, What have I achieved in my life? What have I done with my life? If I look at my life now, 
what meaning is there to it? What have I done? You know? And they call it a crisis because most of the time it's a negative thing. Men try to fulfill it by getting a speedboat or, you know, I said to my wife when we were in Gauteng on tour, I said, you know what? I think when, when I'm a toppy, when I'm a, what is a toppy in Afrikaans? In English. An, old, an older man. When I'm an older man, I'm going to buy, well, and I said, when I'm a toppy, about 40 years old, I'm going to buy myself a Harley Davidson. My wife looked at me, she says, that's not long from now. <laughs> I was about 36, 37, maybe 38 then. I was like, oh, yes, yeah, that's true. I don't want to call it a midlife crisis because I believe it's a very important stage of your life. I want to call it a midlife evaluation or opportunity. It's important to evaluate your life and does it have and ask yourself, does my life have meaning? What have I accomplished? What am I what have I done and what am I still going to do about it? But this depends on what is when I ask myself, what have I achieved? What is your definition of achievement? What is your perspective on success? Because that's going to determine whether it's a midlife crisis or a midlife opportunity. Because if my definition of success is my salary, if I have a house, if I have two houses, if I have a car, if my success is de determined on the, the factors that the rest of the world determines the factors of success, I would classify myself as an utter failure. My personal life. The world considers me a failure. If you look at my salary, if you look at my, my life, if you look at what I don't have, people would consider me a failure. But that's if you uh, use the evaluation stick of what the world considers success or achievement. But how should we measure our lives? How should we evaluate our lives to see where we are in life? Turn with me in the Bible to Philippians 3, please. Philippians 3. And we're going to read from verse 7. Paul is speaking. And he says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss, for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I might gain Christ. I count all things rubbish, that I may gain Christ, and be found in Him. Everyone say, found in Him. Uh, this is your evaluation stick. That I might gain Christ, and be found in Him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God by faith. That I may know Him. Everyone say, that I may know Him. That I may be found in Him. That I might know Him. Amen. Um, where, did, where did I stop there now? That I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being conformed to His death. If by any means I may attain the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected. I am not perfect. I am a work in progress. That's why it's called that evaluation. Midlife evaluation. I'm a work in progress. Um, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid, uh, also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call in Jesus Christ. So what are we saying here? How, what is my evaluation set? How do I evaluate my life to see where I am and what I've achieved? The first one, am I? Do I know Him? Do I know God? And does He know me? 
That is the most important thing. Do you know God and does God know you? What I mean does God know you is where where God testifies on your behalf. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When you're at your workplace, the Holy Spirit is convicting other people and saying, hey, listen to my son. Listen to him. I'm well pleased in him. Look at his life. Look at the model he set you. Look at his marriage. Look at his family. Listen to him. When God is speaking to others about you, then God knows you. Because many, many will come and say, Lord, Lord, we did this in your name, we did this in your name. What does Jesus say? I don't know you. But we know you, Lord. I don't know you. Does, do you know God and does God know you? Are you found in Him is the second one. Am I found in Him? Are you where He wants you to be? Where I am, there my servant will also be. Look, 17 years ago, when God said I must come to Kriari Bloemfontein, I was like, Philip, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Is there anything good? Was there anything at all in Bloemfontein? I mean, even then, Bloemfontein, I mean, the waterfront was two shiny shops and a pep store. Coming from Joburg, it's a dorpe. But this is where God was for me. Irrespective of what I was going to do here, when I told my family, I'm studying mime, my brother looked at me and says, my brother, the mime. Ridiculous, man. But I am where God wants me to be. Wherever I am, whether it's in, the mid- in Siberia in the middle of winter. <laughs> I'm just picturing because I've been there just at the end of winter and I know I'm going to go there again. Wherever God says I must be, that's where I must be. Am I, do I know Him? Am I found in Him? And the third one is, am I doing what He wants me to do? Am I walking in the works that He has prepared for me? Am I working with Him? If those three line up, I am a success. Let me show you a ministry of utter failure, Isaiah 6. We use that with missionary work. Lord, send me. Here I am. Send me. Who shall go for us? Here I am, Lord. Send me. God said, I'm going to send you to people and nobody's going to listen to you. Utter failure. No. Obedience is complete success. Success is not measured by what you've achieved, but have you been obedient? Are you, are you, do you know Him? Are you found in Him? And are you doing what He told you to do? Then you are success. You are in the perfect place. Hallelujah. And if you find yourself, if you're in this midlife evaluation, and you find yourself out of line in those three areas, get yourself in line, Rancher. Get yourself in line, promise. <laughs> It's a, that's why I say it's a good thing to be in a midlife evaluation. Hallelujah. The last part, so we talked about the prime years of our life, midlife crisis or midlife evaluation. The last one I want to say, I've spoken to so many older people over the years. And one thing I hear so often, I wish I could have done this. I wish I could have done this. Ask the most successful businessman you know. His regrets. He'll tell you. I wish I'd spent more time with my family. I wish I'd spent, I wish I'd done, when I was younger, I wish I'd done more for the Lord. 
Don't come to a place where you're living a life where you look back and you have a regret. I wish I had done this. Like Paul says, I forget the things behind me and I look forward to the future and I press in for the prize that God has for me. A determined, willful effort. Amen. There's a great saying, live every day like it's your last. I want to ask you, Leander, if today was your, if tomorrow was the last day, because it's a bit late now, if tomorrow was the last day on earth for you, what would you do for God? That should tell you a little bit about what you should be doing. Those are the priorities in your life. Amen. Then I won't live a life of regret. I'll live a life of fulfillment, of satisfaction. I can look back in my midlife evaluation and say, oh, I missed this, I missed that. But wow, what an awesome life. I look back at my last 17 years and I have regrets. I'm saying this because this is the, probably the last time I'll be preaching to you. Aww. There may be things that I missed in the last 17 years. There may be things that I could have done better or should have done. I don't live, I don't live like that. I'm not an introspective, per retrospective person. I don't have that personality, which is a good and bad thing. But I can look back at my life with fulfillment and satisfaction. You know, it wasn't perfect. I've got a lot of work to go that I, I could have done. But man, what an awesome life. I can see God there. I can see when God did that. I can see when I went there and God did that. I can see so many things. I look at my wife. I look at my family, my child. I look at my friends. I look at, I look at my life and I'm like, Christ. That's my midlife evaluation. There's just parts where I look back and I say, this is where I need to align. No regrets. I bless you with that life. But don't waste the best years of your life. Don't waste the prime of your life. All your energy, your passion. You know, I was playing squash the other day. For the first time ever, I felt 40 on the squash court. Because I'm playing these young guys now. Because well, young is now 35. I'm, they're young, much younger than me now. And they're second league players. And my mind is still 30. I can see the ball. I can see where it's going. My mind is already there. My, my legs are not going to get there at all. But you ha if you have the energy... Spend it on Him. Spend everything you have on Him. You won't regret it. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we just thank You for these years of our lives. Thank You for the season that we're in. Thank You, even though it's a, a, secu a secular saying, the prime of life, Lord. May these be awesome years, an awesome season. But Lord, help us, teach us, Holy Spirit, to spend it all on you, to spend our passion, our energy, our vision. Give us the wisdom to be able to focus on you, even if we have responsibilities, even if we have a, a, a job or whatever it may be. Help us to focus and, and give ourselves in that way. And when we evaluate ourselves, show us where we can be found in you, doing what you want us to do, and draw us closer to you that we may know you intimately. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Conrad. Good evening. I'm probably not speaking to the generation that is in front of me, but I'm speaking to the generation at home. And... Um, but like Grant said, if there's something that you can take from this, please do. Um, 
if you know what gout is, if you ever experienced heartburn after eating a steak and kidney pie, okay, if you've got some uh, vitamins and all kinds of other pills that you have to, to medication that you have to take each day, some for blood pressure, then I'm speaking to you. And um, I just want to encourage um, the older generation and tell you what vital part that uh, there is for you still to play in the family of Christ. Um, I just want you to close your eyes quickly and just imagine this beautiful, beautiful clock, the uh, analog clock with all the, little, um, all the little gears and everything and the springs and everything. Now imagine that clock falling to the ground and getting everything together, putting it back together, but you're missing a spring. Okay, you can open your eyes. All right, do you think that clock will still work? No, because it's missing a vital part. And, you know, sometimes we're so focused on, on what the young people can do of this age, and it's right. And, um, you know, the people in the prime of their lives, and sometimes we forget about very important people. And that is the older generation. So, tonight I brought uh, just, uh, for those of you who don't imagine clocks, I've got some nice hardware here. And this morning I spoke prophetically because I was able to use the big spoon after lunch. But, um, yeah, so you get, you get forks and, and knives for basic, uh, basic eating. Okay? So, you need a fork and a knife and then... Sometimes, if you're very lucky, you get a steak, you need a sharper knife, all right? If you get a little yogurt in the morning, a little spoon, and then there's this spoon, all right? You can see it's in the shape of my belly, so it's for the, the older generation, okay? And it's nice and big, especially when you're having ice cream. It's good to have a spoon like this, but you don't always get, you don't always get ice cream, okay? It's only on special occasions, and sometimes the older generation feels like they're a bit redundant because they see all the, the, the young people taking lead, you know, doing great exploits for the Lord and traveling the world and ministering to people. And, and sometimes the older generation feel a bit excluded. And um, I'm just here to, to tell you that you, you are part of the body. You are vital. You are vital. And on that note, if you're getting older, people have to write you little letters to remind you of things. So before I forget... I just want to announce that next week we will have both our services on the farm. All right? Next week there will be two services, one at 9 o'clock and one at 11 o'clock. It will be on the farm. And afterwards, you're going to need the sharp knife. All right? Because we're going to have a braai and there will most probably be some meat for me, I hope. Um, I'll speak to my wife again. It worked this morning in the service, so I'll just go and speak to her this evening as well to organize something that I can cut with this knife. All right, so that was the note. So now I can really relax. I've done that. Okay, um, I just want to speak about how we as the body of Christ need one another. And um, if you have your Bibles here, you can turn with me to Romans 12, verse 4 to 8. And... Um, that's also a very nice thing for the older generation. You've got laptops, and you can print the scriptures as big as you want so that you can read it easily in church. All right. So, um, for as uh, I'm reading from this 4, Romans 12. For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office, so we, being many, are one body in Christ, and every one members of another. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith, or ministry, let, let us wait on our ministry. For he that teacheth on teaching, or he that exhorteth on exhortation, he that giveth, let him do it with simplicity, he that ruleth with diligence, and he that sheweth mercy with cheerfulness. Oh, that's the New King James. All right? So, 
we need one another. If we're sitting on for a, for a meal, we're going to use all the utensils, you know, and some of them seem like they, you know, you know, don't use them often, but all of these utensils are needed when you're having a proper meal. All right? You will battle to eat um, your, um, your pudding with a fork. All right? And um, you will, ha don't have a, will not have a great time um, if you have to use this spoon to cut some meat. So there's a specific purpose and a specific plan and a specific role for each of us to play. And, um, yeah, I, I think that sometimes um, when we, we, we're always young at heart. Um, for those of you that are sitting here, like Conrad said, you know, um, at school I used to be a good athlete, believe it or not. Okay, and, um, and I started to, to run... Uh, along with the color sports that the school has, you know, and the first time we had uh, the color sports, nobody could beat me. You know, I was like, yeah. But um, the third and the fourth year, as the Creori students came in and they started to participate, I realized that I was not so fast anymore. And um, nowadays, all the first year calls me Wim. You know, and I gel my hair, and I wear some jeans sometimes, but they still call me whim. So there must be something that's giving me away. I don't, maybe it's my stomach that's a bit, um, you know, uh, but it's just for, I swallow the cushion, man, that's all. So, um, so we're always young at heart, but sometimes, you know, our body, our older our body gets, we feel like we can't do the things that we used to do. And um, if I'm speaking to you tonight, you're probably sitting at home. You're probably maybe over 60. And um, due to the virus, you are very restricted and not allowed even to sometimes go to places where you want to go. And to be part of the family here physically at church. But I just want to reassure you this evening that, that you've got such a vital role to play. And the second point I want to just speak about is... Together we will have the victory. Together we will have the victory. And I'm reading from Exodus in chapter 17. I'm going to start at verse 12. And this goes about a battle. All right. For a battle you need all the uh, utensils. Just like for a five course meal. You need all these utensils. The knives, the forks, everything. For a battle. When you engage in battle. You need everybody. That's available, and everybody has got a vital part to play. And I don't know about you, but I'm thinking we, we are in a battle at the moment, a spiritual battle, you know, because um, of the things and the pressure outside, the things that you see on the news, that, like Grant said about that, the world and the opinions of the world, and everything is like, it's like a boiling pot, and you know, you, about the, the virus that's coming... And, and that has taken out so many people. And, you know, lots of people didn't die because of the virus. They died because of complications. Some got depressed. All right? And they, 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 they had so much to look forward to. I, I, I know that for some, um, some people, uh, apart from marriage, the matric farewell is the most important thing. You know, the matrix weren't allowed to have a matric farewell. It's, it's, it's rough out there. Okay? But, um, yeah, so I'm going to read from Exodus chapter 17, verse 12. And it says, So Joshua did as Moses had said to him. Now, you younger people should listen, okay? Joshua was the young guy, and Moses was the older guy. And he listened to Moses, all right? Um, and fought with Amalek, and Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that, uh, that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. All right? So Moses wasn't standing there doing this and, you know, uh, enjoying the fun there. All right? He got tired. He was, he, was, he, was, he, was, he was not a young lad anymore. He was an old man, and his arms grew tired and weary, so he could not hold his hands in the air anymore. All right? And he, and he, and he got tired, and then, you know, he got some strength again and held up his hand, and, and, and it, was, 
it was clearly seen on the battlefield, the effect that him raising his hands and letting down his hands had on the battle. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur uh, stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua, um, I don't know what this word is, but I think he defeated it. Discomfited. Discomfited. So, okay, I'll just make like I'm old and I couldn't read what's standing here. All right. Amalek and his people with the edge, edge of the sword. Now, I like the Afrikaans better on this. You know, it says the defeated, discomforted. I mean, I'm discomforted when I don't have a pillow underneath my head. This was, not, this was a battle. Okay, and the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek um, from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nissi. And it means the Lord is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord um, will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now here's a perfect example of everybody being involved in the battle. Um, Moses was an old man. Remember when he was young he had quite a temper. Okay, He killed an Egyptian. All right, he was a strong man, and he and he killed somebody. He he had strength. All right, but now he's an old man. Okay, he's an older. His generation is getting old, and he's standing on the mountain top with the strategy, and he's telling the younger generation, he's telling Joshua what to do. All right, and Joshua gets the credit, not Moses. It says, and Joshua defeated. But w- was Joshua able to defeat by himself? No, if Moses didn't hold up his hands, his hands wasn't in the air, then Joshua would have lost. But Joshua gets the credit. All right? Um, That's the one thing, you know. He stood there, he gave instruction, he held his hands in the air, and the younger generation won the battle. We need the old generation. We need the people of old for guidance, for instruction, all right, and to help us to fight this battle. And if you are at home and you feel like you don't have a role to play, that you're redundant, I want to just, I just want to um, speak to you tonight and say, please pray for the young generation. Pray for us for wisdom, and pray for strategy. Pray for wisdom, and pray for strategy. You know, they could have easily said, oh, you know, take a look at Moses. Oh, he's not that fit anymore. You know. I see he's like, he's deteriorating. Look how his hands is shaking. You know, um, yeah, he, he, he just sits now and we have to go and do the battle. No, that's not right. We, we need somebody that can now speak to the people. Because Moses is, I don't know if you picked it up, but Moses is struggling quite, quite seriously now that he's getting older, you know. And without that staff in his hand, he, he can't even walk proper anymore. That was not the case. The younger generation saw that Moses' hands grew weary. They supported his hands. They gave him a rock to sit so that he can be comfortable. All right, Because they realized if Moses doesn't keep his hands in the air, we're in trouble. You know, I've got some people that, that pray for me and I praise the Lord for people like that, you know. You don't always see them. They don't get the glitz and the glamour, but they are the people that are holding their their hands towards the air so that I am able to stand here tonight even. I've got a group of people that pray for me. Um, They always ask me, what can we pray for? Um, You know, and they're not very far. They just get across the street. I've got a group of people there um, in the old age home. And um, they really keep my hands in the air. And I just want to say thank you to them in advance, for, for just, you know, keeping their hands in the air. And they're keeping their hands in the air, not just for me, but for this church, for the Creori students. I don't know if you're aware of these people, but they really give themselves. All right, and um, I just want to honor them tonight. Um, so, I just want to say that 
we should really, really, really realize that, that we must do this together. That every one of us in all, all over the generations has got a vital role to play. I'm going to read from Joel in chapter 29, uh, sorry, chapter 2, verse 28 to 29. It says, and it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. And your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men, your old men, sorry, shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And um, I just want to see how much time I've got. I've gone over my time. Okay. Um, but here it says that your old men, old men, sorry, shall dream dreams. And I just want to encourage you know, the generation of, of older people to say, I pray that God will give you dreams and that you will start to pray out these dreams. Pray out these dreams. Pray out what God is showing you because in His Word He said He will give it to you. All right? Sometimes we pray out of fear. We take a look at the media and we, we pray against certain things, but I want to really trust together with you tonight that the Lord will show you in dreams what you need to pray for and that you will please pray for that. Let's just close our eyes. Father God, thank you that we can come to you tonight. And Lord, thank you that I can just bring the older generation before you. Father, where they are at home, maybe a bit feeling a bit isolated, not being able to join us here physically, but... Thank you that they can be here in the spirit and thank you that they will also receive this footage. Lord, I honor you for each and every one of them, Father. Thank you just for their faithfulness to, to hold their hands in the air so that we can fight the battle. Lord, we honor you for them. We thank you for them, Father, and thank you that, that you will give them the dreams, Lord, that they will start praying that out, Father. I pray, Father, that they will not be uh, fearful of the circumstances and maybe the intimidation of the enemy, Father, but that they will stand strong, Father. I pray that you will show us also where we can assist, where we can help supporting them to lift up their hands, Father, where we can make it more comfortable for them, giving them a place to sit, Father. I pray that we will also be practical and that we will reach out to the older generation. We honor you for, for them and we honor you for the fact that, that we can be here tonight, Father God. We thank you for that, Lord. And I pray, Father God, that we will all realize how we need one another and how every one of us has got a specific role and a vital role to play in your kingdom. Father, where we are um, in, in interesting times, Father, I pray that we will be united, that we will be united across all ages, across all generations, Father, across all cultures, Lord, that we will take hands, Father God, and that we will stand up for you, Father, that we will, that we will speak forth what you are saying. Thank you, Father, that I can pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.